Hi there, I guess this little video is a cross between an unboxing of my Assault Group and Warlord games, World War II Japanese miniatures, and my kind of inspiration and interest in uh, the Japanese army of World War II for bolt action by Warlord Games. When I was a kid, my parents recorded most of the World at War series narrated by Sir Lawrence Olivia, and it really made a deep impression upon me, particularly the episode, I think it was episode six, Banzai, where the Japanese basically, uh, as per this history of it all, kind of come out of nowhere um, and just destroy all the presumptions around European supremacy in Southeast Asia in a matter of months, the kind of the Japanese super soldier. Singapore's fall meant that the whole of Southeast Asia lay at Japan's feet. Within weeks, the Japanese army was at the borders of India and the Japanese navy was steaming close to the shores of Australia. It succeeded beyond their wildest dream. I guess these days you'd get more of a, a nuanced view of where the Japanese were coming from, even if it's pretty hard to agree with it. But I mean, this was the 70s. Check this out. Japanese closed in for the kill. <laughs> But I guess that is aggressive nationalism in action. And I read Max Hastings' book Nemesis, The Battle for Japan, 1944 to 1945. And I must say, by the end, you just ask yourself, what were the Japanese thinking? I mean, they attacked Pearl Harbor. They did very well. Yamamoto told them, you know, this can only end at the gates of Washington. But by the end of the war, the American industrial machine is making so many warships. They don't even have the people to man them. Now, Warlord Games' bolt-action, large-scale World War II skirmish rules do bring out the fact that at the beginning of the war, the Japanese are highly motivated and pretty well-equipped compared to their opponents, but by the end of the war, are still very well-motivated, but are very badly equipped opposite their opponents. And the meta, the, 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 how the game ends up being played, really is the Japanese just having hordes of infantry, including loads of people with bamboos, even though I think it's for a bit of warfare that doesn't really happen very often on the home islands with civilians just being handed sticks and told to get out there. The army special rules for Japan are death before dishonour and bolt action, whereby you know the Japanese belief in personal sacrifice to win the war comes out in uh, if you are involved in a combat instead of just dying or your whole unit dying if you've lost the round of combat on numbers you basically keep fighting again and again and again until you're all gone then there's Banzai charge and uh, that's probably the most significant sort of tactical rule that makes the Japanese different because in bolt action every time you get shot at um, you, you start taking and, and you get hit even if there's no damage, you start taking pins representing everyone kind of huddling down, trying to work out what's going on, the officers yelling. But the Japanese, basically, if you just declare, we're just charging that unit we can see, um, you just automatically pass and remove one pin counter, um, which is very powerful, especially in defense, actually, because you wait for the enemy to come along, you've accumulated however many pins, and then you, whatever's left of you just runs out and charges them. Although I must say, as per this Peter Dennis piece of artwork, I can't imagine that Banzai charges were particularly valuable bits of military tactical doctrine. I mean, they never worked for me. You can see on the left, the uh, US Marines have staked their positions, and my opponent, when we started and we were choosing scenarios, said, hey, yeah, let's let's just play the usual kind of you know, whoever knocks out the most units kind of, you know, standard scenario, um, which was very evil of him because obviously he then just dug in, sat there, and every um, US Marine unit has, like, two bars, those, like, light machine guns which just chuck out huge amounts of lead plus everyone else firing at some advantage. I can't remember what it is. 
and flamethrowers. He has lots of flamethrowers and a tank. And so um, I realised I couldn't just sit back with my little knee mortars and rifles and no particular benefits. And I had the Banzai charge rule. And so there are my hordes of people charging forward. And it didn't go very well for us over here. And though it went better for us and the Empire of Japan over here with these bamboo stick guys, Banzai charging into the bunker and killing pretty much every single US Marine, except for the commander who jumped out the back. Um, overall, the game went really badly for us. And as that game came to an end, I exclaimed to the store at large, you know, crikey, this Japanese army of mine is not really optimised. And what I had in mind was, really, I need to get a whole horde load more of infantry, which I then went and did, and which is really, I guess, the subject of this video, which I am coming to shortly. And I remember some dude from the other side of the store, who's a bit of an expert on World War II and Japanese history in general, shouts back, he goes, mate, the Japanese army was never optimised, which is true. And where your units start off the game hidden, they get to start off in ambush, which is not particularly big, I would say. So the Imperial Japanese army formed the largest component of the Imperial Japanese forces with the bulk of the manpower the Type B IJA Infantry Squad normally consisted of 13 men, an NCO, usually a corporal or gocho, armed with a rifle or rarely a submachine gun, but it's so much more fun to give them a submachine gun, and there are four of these models with submachine guns in the assault group range, and which is great because I'm not going to take more than four units of infantry with 13 dudes in them each. But there they are, move them back. 11 riflemen armed with the Asikara Type 38 or Type 39 rifle. And so that's what we've got swathes of over here. Let's move the camera in a professional panning action without knocking the camera over. And that's what this army, the swathes of these dudes over here is about. Some of them seem to have helmets. Some of them seem to have caps. Some of them seem to have a bit of a sunburn covering neck uh, bits of cloth some of these are kind of patrol meandering about the edge of a perimeter type uh, mode presumably for those chindit games but i just mash them all up together in one but i mean they are some of my favorite models the sentry version and then there are a few in a kind of bonsai charge mode, and they too are good fun. I suppose largely reflecting that for much of the war they were fighting a defensive position. Loads of them are just kind of hocking, as they say, waiting in the bushes. And that's basically all of these. Now, I'm not a great fan of miniatures in prone position, but there are a few mashed up into the rest of the packs that you get from the assault group. And there's nothing wrong with them. They're all right. I always put them towards the back, and so they're the first to get shot and taken off. I sprayed these with, um, I think it's the Army Painter Desert Yellow. And I'm hoping that it'll be a simple matter of dry brushing them with, say, Iraqi sand, mixing with a bit of that, and then adding a little bit of white. So we're talking three layers max, uh, and then just giving it some kind of wash, and then doing the putties, whatever it is, uh, khaki or white color, the rifles, you know, dark brown and silver, a bolt, you know, a bolt gun metal type thing. And then oh, it's going to be, I mean, obviously skin is highly controversial. But to the extent that you can generalise and you basically can't, uh, someone on Cool Mini or Not, where there are loads of fantastic painters, kind of broke down every single kind of group of uh, skin colours of the world and how best with, I think it must be Vallejo paints, you could kind of achieve that or mix it up. And uh, for the Japanese, it looks to me like because I'm no genius at interpreting all that gobbledygook below there, 
but it looks to me like you basically do a mix of 40% kind of some kind of normal European flesh color and then just add a lot of chocolate browns, more chocolate browns, so 60% chocolate brown, 40% the European skin tone and I suppose highlight up from there with you know, tads of the European skin tone just wherever you think your light source is. Although the reality is these may never get painted, but it doesn't matter. I'm basically playing um, the equivalent of a, a giant board game with them. And are they ever going to all get painted given the numbers? So that's the infantry. That's obviously early war infantry, mid war and late war infantry. But then we get to the bamboo squads. Before the war finally ended, the Japanese prepared to resist with whatever weapons they could muster. Although as many firearms as possible were issued to those able to use them, others were equipped with nothing more than a sharpened bamboo spear. And these cost tuppence halfpenny. You can get a unit of 10 for about 50 points. And they are green, which means they're an outside chance. They won't be remain inexperienced. But they also get fanatics. Um, which, and they also get the bonsai charge rule which means you automatically pass order tests, because in bolt action, getting pinned, taking pins and being shot at, um, makes you makes it harder to pass order tests, makes you take order tests and then harder to pass the order tests to actually do anything. And for most armies, that leads to any unit with a pin just sitting there doing not much for most of the game, except rallying or occasionally being able to take a shot. But these guys, you can just keep charging them. And if you put them in reserves, they can just come from the side and take the enemy unawares. So let's have let's make a clunky sound and move all of these infantry back and then move all of these Warlord Games uh, miniatures to the centre. Now the thing is they are a bit smaller and scrawnier, I think, reflecting maybe that they are youths, but also uh, suffering from malnutrition towards the end of the war. I mean, I do, I'm do. i a bit annoyed that I think they could have come up with a cleverer solution than long bendy spears. I think they could have just given them uh, empty hands and then basically said, look, you know, uh, Fireforge make these amazing spears, you know, just chop off the metal ends. And then you've, you know, you've got a solid stick that won't bend. I think they should have done that. So there's the officer. It looks about 16, but with a lot of conviction for the Emperor. And then a load of dudes charging forward. They are consistent in scale with the assault group, which is great. A bit scrawnier, a bit skinnier, but as mentioned, they would be. They look like they are teenagers. We won't question the ethics and morality of all gaming in general and what this all represents. It's all to do with historical recreation and entertainment. Full stop. Right. So we then move them to the side. And we look at our medium mortar and medium machine gun. The standard Japanese medium machine gun of World War II was the 7.7mm caliber Type 92, introduced in 1932. This was a refinement of basically nicking the French Hotchkiss. The Allies called it the Woodpecker on account of it sounding like a woodpecker. And I think there's nothing particularly special about the medium mortar. But if I do ever manage to get around to painting these one day, won't it be fun putting bushes and things around them to make it look like they have really put themselves into the jungle? And what we've got here is a suicide anti-tank team, although I think each individual dude is an individual suicide anti-tank team. 
The lack of anti-tank guns capable of taking on heavier tanks such as the Sherman led the Japanese infantry to develop desperate anti-tank weapons involving extreme risk and sacrifice. They would wait in disguised pits holding artillery shell and then just jump out of the pit and blow themselves up against the tank. And what I must say in terms of bolt action is, even if the enemy doesn't take tanks, you get an extra um, action dice for these, which means you've got more of your action dice in the bag, being with a greater potential for your, it being your action drawn out, uh, which means you, you know even if a dice comes out and it nominally represents these guys, you can use it to bring on, uh, you know, to move your infantry forward or use a tank. And that's what I do. Then we've got the snipers. He's a spotter, actually, and I use him as a spotter. We'll come to him in a moment, but these are some quite cool sniper models. The jungles of South Asia provide a plenty of opportunity for snipers to make their mark. The Japanese sniper was well served by the Type 97 sniper rifle with telescopic sight. Um, yes. You don't really want to be on the receiving end of that. Last game, I never took too many snipers. I took one because what you're allowed to do is take a single man sniper with a light machine gun. And so you could, I could use these machine guns, these light machine guns within a unit, which I don't really. But you can also use them as individual snipers, albeit I think you can only take one individual sniper with a light machine gun. Then there are a few of these light mortars. The Japanese developed a range of grenades that could, by means of separate adapters, be fired from rifles or the Type 10 and Type 89 grenade launchers. This must be one of those. They made great use of them for close range support and were called new mortars by the Allies, but they weren't. They were planted firmly on the ground, just like any other light mortars. And one of the basic Imperial Japanese infantry squads is called the Grenadier Squad, with 16 men, and three of them can carry a Type 89 grenade launcher, but they need another dude to kind of help them. Although the Type 89 launcher was commonly used throughout the Pacific Theatre, it was often ineffective in dense jungle fighting because the impact fuse tended to detonate on striking the jungle canopy. Oh well. Whenever I use them, they don't very often hit. They've only got a one inch template. But no one likes the sound of mortars being fired at their unit. Flamethrowers. I didn't take any in the last game. Obviously, the Marines always take a vast number of flamethrowers. One to think about. Because I must say, the medium machine gun tends to be largely pointless in bolt action. And the mortar tends to hit not very much. So maybe they just get replaced. I use snipers and flamethrowers. And this is the quite substantial officer core. I mean, these guys with the swords are not very useful. They look great fun, but they tend to get shot before they get anywhere. More charismatic is that fellow with his glasses and little moustache. He looks a bit more high command, as does he. we come to the Type 95, sorry, Type 91, 105 millimeter field gun, which is actually Warlord Games. And I had, I mean, as you can see, it looks, it looks pretty old. It must, it must be pre-World War II design. Might, it looks even World War I design. Let I me mean, look at that. I mean, I had a lot of trouble making this, it was metal. I mean, just getting all the bits to kind of 
the stick with super glue was not fun. But I must say, my opponent always seems to be unduly scared of these. The joke is, with indirect fire, they don't tend to hit very much, starting needing a six. But if they do hit, they do cause mayhem. The miniatures weren't great, I thought. I mean, that's the assault group quality. And, you know, these guys don't look great and they're a bit small. So, you know, someone out there, why don't you make some fantastic Japanese models for um, artillery support. And he's the spotter. I need a few more spotters, although frankly, you can designate anyone a spotter. They don't necessarily need to have binoculars. You know, there might be people who actually have reasonable eyesight. This is the Type 92 70 millimeter infantry gun. Tiny, with a short barrel, but they could just carry it across the jungle by horse or mule. Again, a warlord model. That's not fantastic. But it's from the very early part of their ranges. I mean, the big point here is none of the stuff is plastic, except for the tank. So let's talk about the tank. The Type 97 Shiha medium tank, Japan standard medium tank, but with only 15 tons, excellent speed, and not much armor, it was basically considered a light tank compared to any other contemporary army. Low velocity 57 millimeter gun also featured a rear facing machine gun. Although obsolete by the start of World War II, it continued production until the late, until late 1943 and presumably was fine in China when they fought people who hadn't seen a tank ever in the wilds of rural China. But I imagine when I met the Marines, it didn't last long. I imagine what they probably did with these is just use them in defensive positions and kind of half buried them. And we'll start to uh, end this with me giving a brief summary of a recent game I played. This time I was a bit wiser than I've been in the past when my Marine opponent said, hey, let's just, you know, play a standard scenario of just, you know, kill the most enemy units. I was like, no, 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 no. Because obviously, as with the last two games, that just means that you and your enormous firepower sit back. I can't outshoot you, so I have to charge you and then you mow most of me down, and it doesn't turn into much of a game. So let's just roll on the scenario table. And we got one of the attacker-defender scenarios, which I think is entirely appropriate given, you know, this is basically an island-hopping scenario. And so I got to be the defender, and I placed four markers, these D3 uh, dice on my side, and they were the objectives. He had to get, I can't remember what it was, if he got one, it was a draw, if he got two, he won... Something along those lines. Anyway, if you got none, he lost. And um, so I set up all of my units. We're talking about a Chiha over there. Um, I think that was a, a heavy uh, piece of artillery. I love taking heavy pieces of artillery. They don't often work out, but if they do, they cause mayhem. And they certainly encourage an enemy like the Marines not to just dig in and sit there and kill you. Um, and I had a few of these... Uh, you can see them hiding in the bushes. Um, what are they called? Uh, like um, anti-tank uh, single bloke kamikaze units who just run out and blow up American tanks, um, which usually cause enormous fear and at the worst give you loads of extra bolt action dice to maximize the chances out of the bag that your guys are going and the enemy isn't. Um, medium machine gun over there. Pointless. Would I take it again? No. You know, that's the thing, the Japanese list in bolt action just rewards you for taking hordes of bamboo spearmen. And as you can see by the yellow markers, which are the pin markers, uh, what the attacker gets, because obviously it's not a great scenario for them, but what the attacker gets is uh, they get to lay down a barrage, which uh, gen which causes some casualties on you as a defender, um, if they're lucky, but more likely just gives you a whole load of pins, which takes you time to kind of rally from uh, and limit your ability to uh, carry out anything except rallying uh, because it makes it harder for you to give normal orders. And in the top right there, you can see loads of American units who will um, move on whenever their dice is picked out of the turns bag, as and when. Now, for reasons I can't fathom, I think it'd been a long day. I'm not that bright. 
And so I remember the Banzai charge rule, because even though these guys had some pins, that, that the students over here, I just charged them up because they automatically passed and they just charged the nearest American unit. And I thought, why am I charging? He's got to come to me. Doll. And comically, when I tried to order that unit back in the next turn, they failed their order test, um, presumably thinking, but we're Banzai charging. That's what we want to do. We want to die for the emperor, and you want us to come back. So they then ended up being stuck there. And so the next turn, I thought, hey, you guys want a Banzai charge? Banzai charge. Enjoy. Um, and this picture isn't quite right, because we realized that you, you declare your charge, then the American defenders shoot, and then whoever survives gets the charge. Um, and here I foolishly, you know, Games Workshop like just charged them all in. But anyway, the way it worked out was they buns I charged, they were happy to do it. There were two flamethrowers in that small American unit. There's always two flamethrowers in this dude's small units. Um, or at least it seems that way. And most of the Japanese just were in absolute terror and fear and just died. And I think the rest fled because Fnatic doesn't help if you've been flamethrowered, which I guess is fair enough. So this never actually really happened. So that was a pretty dumb tactical move. You may have noticed that theme throughout these video logs. But then I kind of started to wake up and remember how to play bolt action, having not played for more than two years. And um, I thought, look, you've got a massive pile of dudes on that hill. You seem to think you're going to stay on that hill and just keep taking pot shots at me. So we're going to take a couple of shots over two turns with this heavy howitzer. Um, and he was like, well, you need a six. Good luck to you, mate. And I got a six. There it is. Um, he was not happy. Because you just saw the before, and this was the after. Most of that unit died. Um, and also, uh, I had you can make Japanese snipers, a single Japanese sniper with a light machine gun. And he was causing mayhem, which was good fun. And then I thought it was only polite to uh, flank charge, I think it must be turn three um, or four, with all of my uh, bamboo kamikaze students into his, uh, well, looking at him, yeah, his left flank. And that basically wiped out pretty much the rest of everyone over there. Then I realized that my chiha was in the wrong place, and so I moved it up from the right flank to the left flank over a couple of turns along that blue line there to fire at those two American units. Remember, the one on the right there has two flamethrowers. Uh, and the flamethrowers, I think one exploded, and then the other one just kept fluffing it. And so uh, it, they ended up being caught with my chiha uh, waiting for... Uh, well, not that... The units on the right, as you know, got wasted, but the units on the bottom left was just sitting tight, moved forward a bit, and provided supporting fire. So that battle was going nowhere because my opponent sort of swore to himself and said, I thought you were bringing the Japanese. I never thought you'd bring a tank. And so he only had one um, bazooka, which, you know, my sniper rightly took out early on. And so when we came to working out who was going to win, because we'd spent so much time fiddling about trying to remember the rules after all these years, there wasn't time to actually finish. But, you know, we'd done, I think, five turns, and my opponent was like, look, I might get one of those uh, markers on your side. I'm not going to get enough to win. So effectively, you've won. And I thought, way, hey. Thank you for watching to the end. If you enjoy this, please do uh, hit the like button. Offer any comment you want. It doesn't have to be warm and supportive. You can say anything you like. I take it all as constructive criticism, be it about my limited historical understanding, poor painting, new painting tips, although here I didn't really paint them at all. Um, and please do subscribe if you want to see these one day get painted or if I delve into um, Chain of Command because I do enjoy bolt action. Um, and you may have laughed when I said, you know, after two years it took us a bit of time to get to grips with the rules given how you know beautifully simple they are and streamlined. But I understand Chain of Command involves fewer figures and is a bit more granular. So my opponent and I have invested in a set each and we'll see how that goes but uh, I hope to see you around here soon and keep well